Hello. Hi. Good evening. Um, my name is Tom Evers. I'm the executive director with the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. And on behalf of the board of directors of the Minneapolis Parks Foundation and our staff, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, before I introduce our host and our guest, I want to take a few moments to uh, share a little bit about uh, the Minneapolis Parks Foundation uh, and who we are. We're an independent nonprofit and a philanthropic partner to our wonderful Minneapolis Park and Rec Board and other partners. Um, and our mission is to transform lives through parks and public space by aligning philanthropic investment with community vision. Um, parks have a power to connect us, to heal us, to make us whole. And Minneapolis is a world-class city because we value city parks as integral to the human experience. The Minneapolis Parks Foundation aspires to find new ways to ensure that the Minneapolis park system continues to divide, uh, define us by thrive, by, as, a defined, as a thriving, diverse, and healthy city. And we envision a park system that weaves together the best of our public and private sectors to generate new solutions for complex urban environments and to, invite, to inspire residents and visitors alike to connect with each other in new and meaningful ways. You're participating tonight in one of our longest running programs, the Next Generation of Park Lecture Series. Um, it's an always free event that we host. This is the first of the spring season. Um, and it brings together global design innovators and thought leaders to Minneapolis, to our city, to showcase what they're doing in other places, how they're working in communities, and, and how they're delving into important issues that are affecting, uh, that uh, affect us as well and how we might bring our communities together. And so tonight, I couldn't be more honored to include uh, our guest, Lily Ye, among our list of speakers. She is wonderful. And uh, though Stephanie Curtis will formally introduce her with uh, Lily to you, I just have to say that the past day getting to know Lily, she is an, a wonderful uh, uh, bundle of joy. Um, she has, she's a joyful, peaceful provocateur, um, and she, I've watched her transform a group of strangers into a playful family in only a matter of hours. She really is, uh, is, is what she, she is all that she, uh, that we have said she is. Um, she speaks often of joy, and she's simultaneously irreverent, irreverent and kind. And so we're thrilled to have her join us. Um, I want to thank Minnesota Public Radio for being a presenting sponsor. They've really been a great uh, team member as we've uh, grown this, this uh, the Next Generation Park Lecture Series. And um, the event was also produced in partnership with the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and the Minnesota College of Art and Design. And we've really, um, it's been a great partnership. So thank you to both those institutions and the Minnesota Public Radio. We couldn't do this without you. And thank you to our donors. We are an independent nonprofit. We require our donations. And so the gifts that many of you have made or will make help us do our work throughout the city and help make sure we continue to aspire. So thank you. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our host, Stephanie Curtis, who will then introduce our speaker. Um, Stephanie is a senior producer with Minnesota Public Radio, a film buff. Uh, you might have heard her on the radio, and she's a co-host of the Cube Critics podcast. And I'll also note that Stephanie is an extraordinary and uh, uh, interviewer. She is very astute and a lover of parks herself and a true uh, urbanite. She loves the city we live in. So with that, I introduce Stephanie Curtis to introduce Lily. Thank you for coming. Hi, I'm so excited. We're going to have a great evening. Uh, Lily Ye is just going to be an inspiration. I. Um, she started off as an artist who, like, you know, like, like most artists, a visual artist who made art that was seen in galleries. And then she started working in, in Philadelphia. And the organization is the Village of Arts and Humanities. And through that group, she figured out that her true calling as an artist was helping to amplify the voices, the experiences of other people. And since then, she's taken Barefoot Artists Incorporated around the world. She goes to other countries and helps other people tell their stories and helps them share their stories. And I can't wait to hear what she has to say because I want us, when you're watching it, think about not just what Minneapolis parks can do, but what you can do in your own neighborhood, in your own yard. And anytime you're in a community meeting, uh, when you're just like, 
getting, getting together with people in your neighborhood, in your whatever temple or s church you go to, or uh, a school gathering, or even your office mates, and think about what you could do to inspire the same kind of creativity and storytelling and sharing and joy that Lily sparks through her art. Um, it's going to be really an exciting presentation. And uh, in your um, uh, pamphlets that you got, there's cards, and you can write questions, comments, and then they'll be handed off to me, and I will be the, the ventriloquist reading them for you. So you can share your stories and your questions for Lily. So as you're watching it, write them down, we'll gather them, and then afterwards, we'll be able to talk with Lily together. So with no for more further ado, Lily, yay. North Philadelphia, reluctantly at the beginning, but eventually it totally changed the direction of m my life. And so the Village of Arts and Humanities, probably some of you have heard of that. And I, um, I began in 1986. I mean, it's like, a, I, um, it just kind of life created the opportunity. And I was invited in by Arthur, the late Arthur Hall, um, he, the, Anyway, um, so there, he said that he has an uh, abandoned lot, and his building is the very raggedy building, um, but he's a wonderful dancer, it was a wonderful dancer and choreographer. And he said, um, why don't you do some do build and park um, my abandoned lot? And I um, didn't know too much, and I was kind of brash. I didn't know how to build park, but I said, well, yeah, why not, right? <laughs> so then everybody was writing proposal. I said, so I wrote the proposal too. And when I got $2,500 out of the $5,000 from Council on the Arts, that's when I felt, felt frightened. And I said, they gave me money to do something I don't know how to do. <laughs> and so I was scared and I asked um, yeah, professionals, how do you do the part? And people said, oh, you cannot do it and you're an outsider. People are not going to like you. Kids are going to destroy everything you build and uh, you should do a feasibility study and forget about it all. It's a great idea. And by the way, at that time, 10 houses were uh, abolished. And so I have uh, this big lot. So it was an honor honorable way to withdraw. And then when I was writing the letter, the voice in me spoke and said, if you do not rise to the occasion, the best of you will die. Mm -hmm. And the rest will not amount to anything. And I was teaching at the University of the Arts and I show in exhibition, I had a good life, but I was missing something. And then it spoke. And that made me dare to take the step to enter. 
Nobody came to me. That was during the 60s. Everybody going to New York and artists, big investments over. I couldn't even talk about working in inner city. But I said, I have to do this. And the only people who came were the children. And sometimes street, you know, that's my first. And Jojo, right? Jojo, the person um, wearing a bas um, base a baseball hat. And, uh, and so he stepped in to help me. The rest were uh, the kids. And we didn't have a lot of money. Um, but then it forced us to be innovative. Mm -hmm. And I said, this place is so dead. It needs something growing. But we couldn't buy trees. So we make our trees. Mm -hmm. And so the kids on the street helped us to make the trees. And our trees, the, the first ground we made, they collapsed and so forth. But it's OK. We make another one, right? Mm -hmm. And my first, um, uh, my first um, a t a crew is the little children. And so because we're making things, Philadelphia Green gave us all this, um, um, what do you call that? Uh, 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 chips, yeah, chips. And so uh, little Yama, three and a half, and brought his toy truck to help us to transport. That's my first crew. And then uh, Jojo, because we, we, are, we didn't have resources, and so we recycled. Um, the um, uh, Belgian blocks and whatever, and sometimes st street people would stop by and so forth. That's how we started. And uh, I remember uh, when uh, I, I remember that summer, 1988. It was so hot for one month, over maybe you know 90 degrees, 100 degrees, and so we're so hot. And adults all watching, and oh, kids came. You know they don't mind the heat. And I say to Jojo, I said. Why wouldn't the adults come and help us and just watch us? So he just started laughing. He said, helping you? They're laughing their teeth off uh, about your project. And I was a little hurt, you know? And I said, why? They say that the word on the street is that a woman who and a bunch of kids and who didn't know what they were doing. So I look back. Did we know what we were doing? Look at the sculpture we made. The paint's peeling off like leprosy, and our <laughs> columns collapsed. We didn't know. But our head did not know. Our heart know. Mm -hmm. And children know what is the rhythm of life and what is alive. They came in waves and helping us to build. And I realized the power of children. That's my first uh, mosaic crew. Did we succeed right away? Did we plan? None of those things. I just went in because I'm, I felt compelled to do it. And then two failures. Yeah, this the third time I think we, I realized that space become energized. Mm -hmm. And I realized that power, art has the power to transform space. And then Jojo, forever in my heart. And he was on the fringe of society. He was always angry, his eyes rolling. And he, when he talked, he roared to people. And he, we didn't have guns then. But he has his bandana. He has all the hammers and knives and around and so forth. Of course, little boys just adored him, want to be like him. <laughs> and then, uh, so, uh, but then when I came to him, I, I asked, so I didn't, uh, I didn't put him down. I just said, Jojo, I need, it. I need your help. That changed everything. So people asked me, how come Jojo is like a lamb to you? Mm -hmm. And then I thought about it. And I said, wow, because the world has always been trying to, to kill his manhood, to put him down, to tell him that he is nobody. And here is somebody, a college professor, came to him and say, can you help me? And just in that asking, then we equalize a common ground. Mm -hmm. Then you don't have to go to theory about um, injustice or you know, hierarchy and so forth. You just set it up so that we help each other and we are on equal ground. And then the anger turned into, um, into activity, joyous activity. And so, um, and the city tore a house down, and uh, like a broken tooth in a row house. And the wall is very nice. I said, what do we paint? 
then I realized that our community is mined. If our people are not careful, especially our youth, then they got in trouble, all kinds of trouble and so forth. And I said, well, we don't have money for expertise or whatnot, but maybe we can evoke the presence of angels to protect our community. Mm -hmm. And since it's African American community, it got to be uh, angels from Africa. And I happen to like um, have a book on Ethiopian angels. Mm -hmm. So they are a tiny little figure. I just blow it up. I blow it up to eight foot tall, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, came big man. Look how big he is, right? 300 pounds and then six foot eight. He wanted to be a football player. He, he hurt his an, uh, uncle and he, um, his dream died. He came to Philadelphia and meshed in, in drug scene. For 20 years, he sold drugs, used drugs, and can kind of destroy his own body and the community and he had no place to go, and he thought he would die in a gutter. And he came to Jojo for refuge. Imagine that, Jojo has nothing. He provided refuge for big man. And he was so quiet and silent. I thought he was mute, but he was so ashamed of his past, and so he, he didn't. So, and I, I uh, was painting the angel, but I, I have a full-time job, and I was raising a family. I needed to help, and I said, paint doesn't work. It peels off. We need to do mosaics, so I learned mosaic. He lost everything, everything, but the only thing he has is time, and so I coached him, and, uh, so, he, and so piece by piece and quietly, and he put his life together again. Mm -hmm. And he suffers so much, any kind of illness, you can name it. And he cannot be um, sitting for three hours. He has to put his feet in ice water to kill the pain. Mm -hmm. But it is the making of the angel every morning, give him the strength to get up. And people say, you, know, you don't sell drugs anymore, you make this for us. Man, that's beautiful, uh, we like it. So the positive feedback is like moisture and gentle rain to his parched heart. Mm -hmm. And he said, this felt good. He, he, if Miss Lily comes back next summer, I will leave drug. And Miss Lily came back next summer and came back for next 18 years. Yeah. And he left the drug with no trauma and no withdrawal and whatever. And the only trouble, he told me, is that he became addicted to mosaics. <laughs> <laughs> so we have so much struggle about what religion and what is right. And we have angels. They don't belong to any religion. And it's just from our spirit to protect us. And they do not move, but their presence is felt all throughout. And so people ask me, how do you get the children to come to you? Well, I got the Jojo, strong man Jojo. And I said, I don't go out and recruit people, but I set baits, right? <laughs> so I have, you know, the children come, and then I have all the wood chips, and I have all the spades and shovels and, uh, and cement mud for them to throw about, right? And then how do you get adults and what the adults watched? and they saw the children were happy. We are addressing the problem of marauding children on the street. Now they come and build things. And for th uh, two summers, and the third summer they came. She's not going to rip us off. And so they came for jobs. I didn't have much, but nobody had much. And so $5 buy a sandwich, well you can do a little bit something, $15, you know, whatever. They became a whole, um, the whole, um, how they are holding position for people who are lost and and disfranchised and get amassed in drugs, and it became a breathing hole for them to find their footing. Because of big man, he thought he um, he, he he was almost hopeless, and everybody loved the big man. He became the most beloved, and I said. Well, gee, why did big men get such favor? You know, <laughs> if we would ask. 
then I realized that because he had sunk so low mm. and he understood what is darkness, what is pain, what is mental pain and the physical pain. And when he regained himself, he has such understanding. He does not judge, he embraces, and that was why. And then I said, wow, big man, now why don't you be the, uh, the, the, the foreman of my crew? I realized six months working with the crew and a reporter came and they were all on drug. And sometimes they came to the job uh, high. I said, wow, what do you do with that? So um, people say that you can't work with those drug people. You know, they're going to ruin your uh, reputation and whatever. I said, but if I don't work with them, who? They're mm -hmm. the one who came to us. But if your family is on drug, do you just expel the family? It's uh, all a part of us. So I put big men in charge, right? Mm -hmm. So he monitors everything. And not only that, he, we hold um, three anonymous um, meeting, uh, NA meeting, uh, uh, three times every week for 10 year time. Imagine how many people come through and they have marathons when hundreds of people from New York and from Washington would come. Now imagine uh, the, the resources we have created. And I want, because I know this is highly, highly educated and accomplished audience here, and I want to put the question out here, and can we think about resources and money more than just hard cash? Mm -hmm. And big men with no resources, money from the government, we create the holding space. We create the healing center. People help themselves. And the story they told from the heart, the renting open, that become our theater materials. And that's how we create the theater for them to air their story like tragedies. And that's where they they find the healing. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we measure that kind of wealth, that kind of resources, and that kind of recycling that discovered the hidden power of all creativity in people, and then bring it about and bring healing, and, uh, um, and turn them into uh, productive citizens? How do we measure that wealth? Mm -hmm. I want to know. So I think we need to rethink so anyway, I said, well, um, let's work together and try to um, deal with the problem. I mean, let's leave the problem aside and let's create together. So we start digging. We dig it. Uh, we, yeah. So this is before and this is the transformation. Mm -hmm. And I call it meditation part because life in inner city is so highly stressed. And so I wanted to create a place it's a, of retreat and people can relax, reflect, and recenter. And I don't have personal wealth. I have very little um, expertise, a few uh, expertise, but I bring, brought uh, things that inspire me, like Chinese garden. You have a fantastic show right now at the museum, just, um, and the Islamic courtyard. And so we're all broken people. But when we work together, we get better, like centipede. And we will move everywhere. And every you know, place is so fast, yeah. So we take on houses. And so this is before and this is after. And this is our first tree of life. Our people do not go um, they have the means to go far. So we bring Islamic culture, we bring Chinese culture, we bring other things um, to our community, okay? So Big Man and I, 16 year partnership, I designed the Big Man, executed it. Mm -hmm. People think of in the inner city of no resources, wrong. That's our lack of imagination. Mm -hmm. But look at the abandoned lot, look at the transformation. And the, all our most beautiful things are open to the community, but we do protect it. We do protect them, how? With beauty. So before, after, yeah.
Yeah, and so funny. This is the big man and his crew, four member crew. They're just from the community, maybe not even graduate from high school, you know. So I just show them some concept. Like this actually is from the Chinese tomb guardian line. That's powerful enough, right? That's mm. ghost, right? Guardian mm. line. And look at big man and his crew. They look African. Don't they look mm. African? <laughs> look African lines. So. In winter, the bad land turned into the land of enchantment. Mm. The world tells us, you're colored, you're woman, you're, you don't go to the right school, and you're poor, and your voice don't count, and you're nothing. I said, wow, we don't have to accept other people's prejudices. And I said, let's clear the table and define uh, us for uh, for ourselves and so we create an art festival we look at ourselves and we are beautiful mm -hmm. and full of talent and creativity and we make our puppets two st so high two story high so we walk down through our park and all our abandoned lot and what and whatnot and we bless all the uh, broken places and we make it so good so um, dazzling our um and we get we get better and then um you have seen broken places become beautiful parks and you see beautiful parks become sanctified spaces mm -hmm. so we use the um the, 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 the torch and light and we bless it with water and rice and whatever you know and uh, we um and the the pivot of the um, of the ritual of our festival is the rites of passage. I mm. felt our young people are the most endangered and uh, we want to tell them that we, uh, we stand by them. And so they go through a certain, a several months of training. They have their ceremonial gone and with a torch in hand, they will march into meditation park and they will ascend the little platform and all the community people would be there and and take pledge. We are your foundation. We stand by you. And the uh, young, the uh, the teens, they would say that we respect you, and we will work hard, and we will realize our potential and bring the light to the future. Mm -hmm. And then I feel the ritual also represent a different way of evaluating creativity, and it's a tribution to people. I believe that everyone has an innate creativity as bright as the, as the sunshine. And the quality is the sun. Sunshine anywhere has that purity and has that fullness. And so, but a lot of time they lay dormant. And so I said, I want to be an artist that can generate and reawaken the dormant creativity and the pilot light in other people so that we all together can shine and dispel the darkness of selfishness, of, of greed, and of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of aggression, and of ignorance, and of selfishness. And I felt maybe that will be holds the hope of, of the future. And so in very early, I, you know, I got a grant, so that's good. One of the few lucky times, right? And the grant is to send artists in as uh, ambassadors to go to, um, go to different places. So I always wanted to go to Africa, the, you know, the, the so anyway, um, it brought me to Kenya. And so the grant was for three months. And so I really didn't know what I would be doing. I brought you know, the, my work from North Philadelphia. <clears throat> and then and the grant is for three months. So for the first month, I had the grand old time. And I went to all their national parks, safari, you know, <laughs> and everything, and watched the wild animals and hang out with expatriate and all the green lawns and beautiful things. But I felt. I was gliding above the ground. Mm. I am not in touch with the culture or the people and so forth. Again, something was missing. And then 
because I talk to people and share, they say that, oh, you must meet um, Father Alex. And I said, what the, who is Father Alex? And I found out he was actually a walking St. Francis of our day. And he felt that um, the, the, the church did not live the principle of Christianity. And he did not help the poor, poor. He not only helped the poor from comfortable places, he inserted himself into the most devastating community and be baptized by the poverty of the poor and follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And there he learned really how to pray on the face of death and crucifixion every day in people's lives. And I was so moved by him, and I was frightened by this place, but he gave me courage. So when you look at this place, it looks very romantic. You have a lake, you have mist rising, and the people walking around, right? But when you get closer, it's the dump site. It used to be a big quarry land, so you have the dead lake and miles and miles of the garbage, not just from Nairobi, from all the world. One morning I was there and people got very excited and I said, why? They're all running to one direction because airplane is dumping was dumping and they could find food in the, in, from that. So I realized this is the garbage dump from the world, you know. And uh, so, and how did I happen? I mean, I didn't just go in, I am a very timid person, but it took me a long time to get the courage. In my, it was a kind of 10 year period of um, time. So I went in, you have really, the children, they came to my workshop and I said, Eventually, I followed them into the garbage dump is their playground. And so I would go walk on the garbage dump with the smell, the fly, and whatever. And with my boots and everything, and I was walking gingerly, and I turned around. You know, this is one, one is Paul from Somali um, refugee, and they have no shoes. Mm -hmm. And this is their playground. And I said, oh, we must got shoes for them. And I turned around, 20 children were there. It just was devastating, devastating. And so this is their community, the houses they lived in. It's all things recycled. And this is the main street, but then during traffic out, it's completely filled with people. This is actually their living room, their you know, activity quarter and whatever. And this is the beloved Father Alex. And he, um, he established the church. And so I, um, the church, has, the only place I can find wall is in the church. So I went in and there are a lot of children everywhere. So I said, well, let's do the shaking. Let's do a, sh a paint shaking dance. Well, people are happy because they become a part of it. What do you paint in this devastating place? And in the churchyard, angels, angels. So that's the transformation, peaceful angel. Over the fence is that dead, um, uh, that, that, that um, uh, lake. And this is the front of the church, and those are Ethiopian angels, and then f flowers and colors, okay? And this is the back of the church. And again, and I remember uh, when I went there, I didn't think beauty can exist in such a place. It's just so devastating and dirty and polluted. But that's the only thing I know how to do it, just put paints on the wall. And so, uh, so I start painting. And then, I don't know, oh, oh the, uh, the picture. So, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Anyway, so I, I just paint. And then I was timid. And I read the book, yeah, there are 50 kinds of illness and parasites you can get to you. So I would put gargles and covered everything. And I said, oh, I hope people understand, you know, I don't want to get sick. And so, you know, who came to my rescue? A little child. He took a look at me. Ah! You're a ninja painter. I said, oh, thank you. That I was. I am. Yeah. And then I saw some paints dropping, and I remember it was a orange yellow. And I, I walked down from my shaky ladder, 
And then I came back a little child in utter wonder, would pick up a little drop of yellow and look at in amazement. Then I realized color there is not just something you describe, rendering and volume and so forth. Color is the energy. Yellow is the sun. And the green is the forest. And the blue is the sky and the ocean. And so I just pure color, color, the, uh, 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 pr pr uh, primary color. And so the, here's the angel, mama angel and the warrior angel, right. And uh, then I sculpted uh, uh, with a, um, uh, a Lawi, the uh, Kenyan sculptor. <clears throat> I love uh, Tang Dynasty tomb figurines. And so, and I th was thinking of that, and he helped me carve shape, and those are angels. And we were looking for homes for the angels. And then I found this abandoned quarry piece with the uh, uh, bars sticking out. And then it's over the fence is the dead lake. On the right is the latrine that smells. And on the little platform on the left is where they burn garbage. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is the perfect foam for the angels. And they need to be here with the people to guard them, to comfort them in their suffering. And when they burn the trash, it becomes the smoke offering to the angel. Just perfect, right? Yeah, you can see the vast land. That's the angels there, there, okay? And then, so, a word spread that there's an, um, a, a Chinese American artist coming here working with the uh, uh, culture, a Mukuru um, community. Mukuru means recycling garbage people. And nobody would ever from outside would set foot in this hellhole place. And, but they heard about it. And so at the opening, my host, it would, which is a, gal a ga gallery that knows international guests and so forth, so we sent out invitation. And our guests came from all the different embassies. And lo and behold, American embassy, of course. And that morning, we got the word American embassy her, uh, uh, um, ambassador herself came. And people, as we paint the paintings, colors, and the angels, you can feel the sense of hope and joy palpable. They were singing something so beautiful. Voila, here, here is the Ambassador Brasilia. Of course, that was in the more innocent days. She was there, mingled with people. And so when outside the people come in with resources, it's like sunlight. And they helped them, started them on different work and whatever. And that day, I re realized that art and working together community effort together has the power to push open the heavy gate of hell and let in fresh air and light. And those are the people, resources coming. And people were singing so lovely, like angels. And I said, what are they singing? And they sing, welcome, welcome our international guest. We're so happy you're here, but please, when you leave, do not forget us. And so, Father Alex said, it's important we are presence and witness so that they don't feel forgotten by the, abandoned by the world, yeah. And then, the best thing, of course, you know, everything I did completely were uh, disappeared by the wind, by the trash, by whatever, in the, the very hot sun and whatever. So I said, wow, that's the way it goes. And then about three, yeah, and of course I went back again. Now the art, the, everywhere is art, but it's there by local artists and the church uh, commission work, so, which is wonderful. But more wonderful is about three years ago on Facebook, right, Facebook. And then I got the message and from a, a young man, he, and he said, Miss Lily, my name is Daniel Onyega. When you paint the church in Core Culture, I was a little boy. Mm. I am a young man now. 
I was inspired. And we, a group of young men, formed a group called the Talking Wall. They had, I checked them online. <laughs> they had painted 1.5 kilometer walls and get community to help on the walls I thought were too broken to be painted on. But they splashed it with color and with patterns. And then they brought, yeah, and, and they brought positive images and uh, a hope for the future. And that is a powerful, that's when art that is so inspired and fertilized, being nurtured by attention and being brought by resources and continue to allow to grow and that roots penetrate deep into pe the land of people's culture. I call that a tree of life. And it continues to benefit, continues to give out fruits. And this is what you, uh, it, you it, it continues to reverberate. Now, I, again, we all talk about um, uh, grants and, um, and so forth. And I, you know, I spent 18 years of my life writing grants and trying and so forth. We always talk about evaluation. I want, I want, us to think about how do you evaluate this kind of impact? Mm -hmm. Impact of big man, impact of a young man I met in prison and he got out. We were doing video, we included him. He continued to learn, my partner continued to coach him. After he came out of the prison, he has no place to go. I, get, I said, come to village, a holding place for him and then Last year, the last year Obama, with the prison, it, it, it's so much in discussion. We opened the newspaper. Here is our L, L um, stay, uh, Sawyer standing next to Obama and mm -hmm. several other people. And his film, he's traveling all over the country and talking about the film, about re civitism and about prison. How do you measure that? You know, that kind of impact and that, how do you measure when people are inspired, the stars in their eyes? And the young people, old people, whoever, they, you know that that's a fertilized seed, ready to go be planted and then be nurtured and grow into that. So I just feel that our, the, the world, our world is, we are in so much pain with the uh, opioid ride, with the tragedy, with the killing. And so we really need to refigure our system of value. What is wealth? Can wealth be more than just measured by cash? Can wealth in a community be kept and be recycled in so many different ways and never come out and, it, it, and just sprout new seeds and growth and so forth? That needs a graduate student thesis and figuring it out. How I think if we can do that, we have so much creativity, imagination, wonderful project. If it goes into community in needs and continue to nurture and not just an installation, gone, and something gone, and so forth. It, let it you know, stay and recycle, and through that, you empower people. You don't need a lot of words. You just set it up. People come in on equal footing. You believe me, you have all the talent, it will, you will find the space to, um, to blossom. Your expertise will fertilize the ground deep and a deep and vast that will change the ground plan. plan. So in a way, um, anyway, after 18 years at the village, it's just too much management, too much fundraising and so forth. And I said, wow, this artist needs to be at the front line. So I left the village, and by the way, village is a wonderful place with a new visionary, a young, um, dynamic uh, director, and still a beautiful place too. Uh, yeah, just wonderful. So 
I formed another organization called the Barefoot Artists and look at our logo mm -hmm. and it has a beautiful big flower against the sunrise, sunset or sunrise. And then in the center is the globe. The mission is to bring beauty to broken places in the world. And one of the places took me to the outskirts of Beijing. When we think about Beijing, we think about glamorous city and full of lights. And then, you know, the, what, the 208 World um, Olympic and so forth. It just full of, um, I mean, just wealth and technology and beauty and glamour, right? But do you see this? This is on the outskirts. This is the, where the children of the migrant workers who build those glamorous city, they have no rights. Their children cannot go to school, a, high, a middle school, and uh, uh, they're looked down by the society. I mean, imagine justice there. And so I did a presentation, and the, the principal heard that I spent 18 years and she, she wanted to return uh, to, it's in New Mexico, I think. She wanted to build a school for Beijing, that's her, her birthplace. And so she said maybe she could spend 10 years or so, right? And so um, um, this is an abandoned factory. They had also very little money. So she acquired abandoned, painted the wall and whatever. And she invited me to come and do a project. And I said, my project is not just about painting a mural and, and doing mosaic and so forth. Whatever you see so far is, 40, whatever you see is 40% of the project. 60% are people like Big Man, like Al Sawyer, and like, a, um, uh, like a Di I mean like a, um, the, 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 the talking walls in Africa, that's 60%, reverberates and continue to grow, okay? So I said, if I come and I want to transform not only the, sc the school, but maybe um, the, the students uh, try in teacher. And also the school is very interesting. And they, they didn't say that you just compete and succeed and then um, get good jobs and blah, blah, blah. What they see, look at the words. He said, trying to be an authentic person. Mm -hmm. And he said, you t learn ten, uh, 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 a thousand times, 10,000 times to be an authentic citizen, authentic. And then you teach students 10 times, 10,000 10, times trying to teach them a true person. You search for the truth. Of course, that's been all needs new def definition. And they have about um, 600 students. How do you teach art? I can teach art six centuries. I said, well, let's do it together. And I figured, you know, we are mostly interested in ourselves. So I said, well, everybody lie down and you trace each other and do self portrait, right? Everybody knows that. And this simple thing is wonderful because it is you, your shape. It is not you. How could it be you? You know, like uh, just a few outline. So I get them to paint together. And in life in China is very regimented. They have to go through exam. They from you know eight hours school. Not like in here, right? You know, all the way. And they live there. That, that little place, that place, six hundred teacher students live there twenty four seven. You know, it's just how you. But anyway. So making, lying on the floor, splashing paint, making a big mess. Man, sometimes it's so free and delightful. And uh, so I said, I'm from thousands of miles away. I have no idea what you want to see. Why don't you tell me? So I conduct a workshop and then they tell me what they like to see, green. Nature. They're from the uh, from the remote country. They want to see um, be beauty, beauty, beautiful plants, natural things, and strong color and uh, pattern. I say, got it. I got my guideline right. Uh, and the, then I said, I want to root the project in something deep. And what's better than Chinese folk art? 
thousands of years old and reservoir of the cultural richness from ancient Shang Dynasty, 4,000 years ago until present time. You know, I don't have time to go into this. It's by an anonymous. It's her home. It's the, it's uh, carved into the low, lowest m mountains. Yeah, and uh, very ancient but very contemporary. Right? You talk about the, the um, energy preservation. But I really love the flowers. So I said. And look at this woman. She was so poor. She lived in a cave and with one window. She was mistreated. But she redefined herself as the queen. She became the Matisse in Chinese contemporary art for many young artists. Mm -hmm. But look at her painting. And she was so poor. She didn't have money for paper. So government has workshop. And then so at the end of workshop, she gathered all the colored paper. Mm -hmm. She cut them into little pieces. Look at that. It's a tree of life. Her flowers rotates like the star. And I said, that's our inspiration. So I made the design. This is a tree of life. The school is called the dandelion. So I put the dandelion, and then I put the flowers. I have no idea to how to do a dandelion. I said, well, let me look Google, right? And the child <laughs> painted this on the wall, existing. I said, wow, life guides me, right? So I said, how about I borrow your dandelion and then put your name next to it, right? Yeah, happy both people, right? Anybody who wants to paint can participate. And this is the first dandelion. The color began to come. So uh, to the school, it, when you, whenever they take picture, right in front of the dandelion. So those are my sketch. This is the site, and this is people participating, and many, many um, mm. students, and this is the transformation. Mm. Yeah. The front of the school, you would not know, right? Mm. So, um, everybody, everybody, mm. transformation. But we don't like there is a white spot, right, blank spot. And we feel that <laughs> and stay. And there is a message: root in your own culture. Chinese folk art. They learn. They look at the books, and learn as much as you can in the school. School nurture you to grow like tree trunks. And then, then um, you build the self-esteem, accomplishment. Then dream to touch the stars on the ceiling. Nice, huh? Nice package. <laughs> I didn't paint it, you know, other people painted it. And the best part, students were inspired. And there was a blank wall, and the student designed something. And then student put them on the wall. Student executed. Oh, what does that mean? Um, and then, uh, yeah, look at that. Looks Persian, doesn't it? Not one, uh, not one tile fall off. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Um, then we can reshape. See, you can do it in the state of art places, but you can do it in the broken places. The broken places we're afraid to go. I discover. Those are the most free space. We talked about innovation and creativity. Innovation, the uh, out of box thinking, and it's hard to be out of box. This box is so nice. I feel comfortable to be in, right? But then when you go to broken places, problem area, nobody found the solution. That's the best place to talk, to figure out about innovation, creativity, out of box. It has to be out of box, right? And so in the school, it's like, look at the words, uh, confidence, enjoy community living, search for truth and creativity, yeah. And then, uh, so I said, wow. So I took a picture of the school. I gave it to them. I said, you designed your school. And one child, very bold, put the rainbow. I said, that is nice. Let's do it. So then 
Oh, we paint the wall. It was February 1st. I remember it was so cold. <laughs> but, you know, our enthusiasm um, thought the cold. And so we reshaped it, you know. So then to bring rhythm and music into the community. <laughs> My buddy, she's so happy. Yeah, rainbow. So every time you come in, the students say they're blessed by the color from the rainbows. And look what the word says. The word says, let love fill heaven and earth. Wouldn't it be a nice thing to, in school, in public spaces, let, let tenderness, kindness fill our heart and the public space, right? They, <clears throat> the best part yet is that uh, the teachers were really inspired. And so they said, we love your tree of life, but we got a whole bunch of problems. And so one day they had a brainstorm session and they listed the root causes and then the manifestation and the result. And they realized, wow, we got the tree of problems. <laughs> so then they took this um, to you, the problems is like uh, cursing, uh, smoking, and drinking, and gang fighting, especially for the new students. And so they took the, this assignment to each classes. They spent a month studying it, creating the tree of problem and the tree of life. Mm. Yeah. So the problem is so severe that your apple burned up. <laughs> and the bugs eat it up and whatever. So then they have one day um, a, a, a exhibition so they all admire each other, learn from each other's work. They have a ritual, 20 foot long. Everybody sign their name, pledges against the, um, the, uh, the, uh, against the um, uh, belligerent, um, be belligerent, uncivilized behavior. And then um, they have testimonies and telling stories. And then I was told that um, after um, the exercise, 70% drop in their problems. This is community solving their problems. Mm -hmm. And so I was so impressed. So I wrote a book, this is a five year project, and uh, I summarized people asked, what is your methodology? I felt that it's so organic, so kind of growing to, dip. so I s wrote the book, and that's called uh, Awakening Creativity. And, uh, and also I summarized the methodology. This is the methodology tree of life. <laughs> so, yeah, right, yeah, right. So the last, uh, I have a very, very short uh, video to share with you, but I don't have time to show you the whole project. So I just want to um, spend one minute introducing, it's the Rwanda Healing Project, okay? And uh, uh, in 2004, I didn't have Rwanda on my agenda, but I was on my way to Kenya, to Kurokocho, um community. And uh, I was invited to do my presentation at uh, um, uh, uh, Barcelona. And there I heard a speaker, Jean Bosco Musana, from, uh, from, um, uh, from Rwanda, Red Cross. And 10 years later, he talked about the pain and the suffering of his people. And I just felt my heart clicked and I said, I need to go there, and I am already on the uh, continent, and I can flew over and whatever. And so, um, I, and then he didn't know me. I had no idea what I could do there, but I just felt I needed to go. <laughs> so I stopped him. I sat next to him for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, and he started to worry. This woman, he's, <laughs> she's following me. Then we discuss, and the, his um, friend said, oh, he, she's an artist. She wants to do something. She's harmless, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so and then I, I said, pick me up at the airport. And so he drove three hours to come to the airport to pick me up. We didn't have an agenda. We just wanted, he wanted to show me. And he showed me a survivor's village and the mass grave. Mm. And then I was so, um, I felt so sad, and uh, 
there's no beauty. I said, can I make something um, a beauty, um, to bring beauty to memorial? But I didn't know I was going to build it. You know, it's just kind of an idea. But then life prepared itself, it happened. And I want to, you to see how it works. But more than that, um, that when you see the memorial, it is the art. It is what is visible, okay, the 40%. And I call this 10-year project Rwanda Healing Project. The other half is uh, working with the um, gen genocide survivors. And uh, it was so dark, so grief-stricken. And so uh, I, did, I, I did the design workshop. They painted their houses and whatever. But I saw that they're hungry. And I, I saw that they needed a job. And so we started, Barefoot Artists start to sponsor sewing and weaving, you know, preserve their culture. And we got land so they can cultivate. We have husbandry, we have, uh, 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 we have a solar panel eventually, and rain harvesting, all that. And so the ninth year I went there, and they say, Mama Lily, every year you come, we needed something. But this year, you just sit tight. And so they have a milk drinking pouring ceremony for the children. And they say, you know, you, we lost our parents, many, but you are like a mama cow. Yeah, I was not like a mama cow. You gave us milk so we can grow up, become adults, and because of the different programs and so forth. And I was anointed as, as Mama Lily and as the Mama Cow of the village, right? Wow. And, so, and so now they are doing just fine, micro landing and everything. That is 60%, you do not see. But the healing project is in total is that. It's a beautiful artwork, but it's how people use it and how things we do transform people's lives. And I call that up art, art in finance, art in engineering. You know, like an a engineer with our borders came to us. So I said, in the darkest place, sometimes it's fullest despair. But if we just go there and start making art, that brings joy to the children. And the joy, play with them, sing with them, scream with them. And the laughter from the children are like ripples of joy that spread out and begin to change the atmosphere and the sense of the place. And that will bring adults to come in. And so, um, but anyways, here is the memorial. Um, and this is the mass grave, but the movie will tell you. The movie is an excerpt from excerpt from a, a full feature movie called The Barefoot Artist. It's about my life and my, um, my work. And that's why there are something personal in, the, in, the, uh, in, in, in this part. I just want to explain that. It looks like um, a shed, an uh, animal shed, um, like a very coarse concrete, concrete slab. And you can't tell that people, um, it was people's remain. Um, the only thing that showed it was a few bouquet of dry flowers. Then I said, it cannot be a grave. You cannot heal uh, by looking at it. Jean Bosco took me to see a couple of other mass graves and they all, some are better made, but they were all um, by builders. They're uh, kind of concrete and bricks and uh, put together. And there was no poetry, there was no beauty. Uh, I said, to truly honor the dead, we have to bring beauty and to remember them in that light. 
And so that was the time when I thought it has to be better. And then he also took me to see the survivor's village. And the village is actually um, deceivingly um, pleasant. So I said, well, this is pleasant until I get the closer look at the people. You just feel, you know, Rwanda is really being defined by before and after. You feel the weight of the killing and the tragedy in their body, in their soul, in their faces. I want to bring art and bring beauty in the building of the monument in order to remember the dead. This is what we do in here. Here, flowers and then stone. Ah, no, no line. Yeah, 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 no, no problem. A space is opened up um, that we all can come in um, to bring our creativity, our strength in equal footing. We go there not just to give but to learn. <laughs> Kwaru muriango dimwa bantu ijana na mirongo itatu na bane haroko turoko aka turi bane gusa Good okay cut this then you have a trunk yeah whichever This is blue 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 yeah Wanare <laughs> ngaho <laughs> When Jean Bosco told me we need to do the memorial first, intuitively I understood it. Because of my father, there was this, this lifelong knot in my heart I couldn't untie. It feels like I couldn't move on until I really look at it face to face. Then maybe I, my life can move on. We need to look at the past, especially places that hurt, and then to look at it face to face, and then to open the wound and to dress it, to hear the stories, and then to honor the memory, and then do our best to embrace that, and then to, to bring to the level of resolve and rest. That's really the reason I moved to the project.
Tuzajya <laughs> She lost her baby, um, but this is her today. And I call that the dance of life and dance of triumph. And to um, end the presentation, I just want to say the guideline of my work. And I think it's the poet um, Lorca, yeah, Lorca um, Gabriel. Uh, yeah. Um, Garcia Lorca, I will always stand with the people who has nothing and who cannot even enjoy their nothingness in peace. And the other one about community work, and he has a beautiful poem, and he wrote, the poem, the song, the picture are only water drawn from the well of the people, and it must be given back to them in a cup of beauty that they may drink, and in drinking, understand themselves. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. I wanted to, first, well, first of all, I don't think you understand what the word timid means. If you keep saying you're timid, you're not timid. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the power of ceremonies and mm -hmm. how you see that working in these spaces because I've watched the teenagers in Philadelphia mm -hmm. uh, making you the, the milk mother of the village. <laughs> how do ceremonies work with all this? Uh, the, you, are you talking about Rwandan ceremony or Just in general? Just in general. Oh. Why don't we have more ceremonies in our lives? Yeah. Ceremony is so important because our life and our activities are so scattered. And so ceremony kind of bring everybody together. Mm -hmm. And also our life is very mundane. You know, that we, uh, we, we, we function from a mundane uh, level. We need to eat, we need to go buy things, we need to pass exam, we need to study, and just a lot of activities. But then there are other things we long. You know, other things like, uh, like um, uh, you know, more, um, more of a different level. The heart and the spirit long something else. 
And I think ceremony often has the ability to, tra to uh, transport us from everyday life um, to the level of a, um, a, of a different dimension and a different uh, reality, yeah. And that can happen through ceremony or cer a certain prescribed uh, action um, that can easily happen, but we need to have the intention to set it up to, for that to happen. For example, if in our busy days we just take um, five minutes and in a quiet, uh, a quiet corner and just do the deep breathing and then just let everything go and we're in a different place, a different space, yeah, so. You've been with uh, people from Minneapolis for a couple days, you've talked to students, you've talked to people who work with the parks and uh, talked to people here at MIA. What advice do you have for us when you think about some kind of a change that we could I, could bring I, to our city. I am so impressed and touched by the city. To begin with, you have um, the, the bounty for um, blessing of nature all around you. And you have this system set up, unusual in America or anywhere that the, uh, the civic um, structure and the park structure is separate. And then you, so you have a keen sense awareness of nature and the power of park and the sense of protection and using be outdoor and so forth. And then um, the de dedication of all the people who work in the art, uh, such great art institute and art. I'm just so impressed. And then also the art school. I, I was at the Natasha's class the, today and the, he, listening to the, store, uh, the assignment they gave to the students and whatever, yeah. And so um, I, I, think, I, I think Minneapolis is really ready to go something even deeper and more ready. You have so much resources from, the, from education, from whatever. And but the circle, but the sheep is round. And then you have the community in needs, that is square, mm -hmm. you know? And whatever that is, opioid or school, you know, problem, and that's square. So you need to figure out how do you get that to plumbing problem, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you structure that, that the, the, the resource from there goes to there? And so um, the broken places, the neglected places and broken communities, that's the, um, that's a, I, I always say that broken place is my canvas. Mm -hmm. Can we take that as our project? And can we um, pay attention? School is always there, university and institution. Mm -hmm. We all have our, um, Guide, uh, you know, kind of guiding lines. But then um, the Park Commission is about transforming uh, people's lives. That's deep, that's profound. And so can we do our education is about, you know, in learning all the technology and all the expertise. We need all of that be guided by compassion and gentleness and sharing and fairness. I think that will be make a lot of difference. It's not about I, but it's about us. And then I think, I mean, my personal experience is that, you know, I, I had teaching, I had a very secure job and so forth. And I wanted, one time, I, um, I, I wanted to show in galleries and museums and make a bundle of money, right? Yeah, right, so, but I failed. But there is such wonder, you know, such wonder in failure. Mm -hmm. And then also I discovered something even better, better than those things, something that anchored me in life. It doesn't matter whether, uh, you know, attack from other people or um, insults and, and, you know, it, 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 it's all fine because I am anchored in something deeper. And where deeper is that 
of the humanity when it's broken, it's more naked. And when you really touch with true feeling, it shocks you but in its intensity. And so, and the reward when I, in, when I see the villagers, you know, now they're happy, they dress nice and whatever, that is my reward. And that is something cannot be measured. But the, it puts stars in my eyes, see? <laughs> right. So, um, and I, I think it is, I mean, you have everything um, just ready. And, but when, and also, like, uh, we, the world is changing so fast, right? We all always have to redefine the reason we exist. It's mm. existential. Like newspaper used to be so big. Mm. Now, why do, how many people see newspaper, right? So if we, we, we do excel in the view we do, but we don't exist alone. We exist with other in society. We need to tune in to the social needs. Mm -hmm. If we are needed by other people, by society, it uh, confirms our existence. Mm -hmm. And so if we can set it up, you know, domination and, uh, um, and competition, cutthroat, profit making, is bring us to the brink of six, six extinction. Yeah, and uh, so, but how could we make it better for uh, our future generation, for this generation and for our future generation? And thank goodness that our children, the younger generation, refuse to accept what is established. I mean, they dare, you know, to, to take action. I think that's what, what we need to do. Maybe just orient, for example, like money. How do you measure money? You know, the, on the news, uh, new uh, broadcast, all, every day you hear Dow Jones, right? Dow Jones, and then what's the other? You know, stock market Nasdaq. going up and yeah. uh, Nasdaq yeah. going mm -hmm. up and down. But maybe we need to find other ways of defining national wealth. I mean, look at the uh, Nepal. No, uh, no, not Nepal. Uh, next to Nepal, what's the country? Bhutan. 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 With the Bhutan. Index. Right. Their national, their measure of national wealth is happiness. Mm -hmm. But imagine that. <laughs> it, it, so if we do happiness, I mean, I heard happiness, that course in Harvard is the most popular. So what does it say <laughs> about us and about our society? You know, so if we can say, well, success means that we are happy, we are, um, we are less stress and less fear and less dumb, more sharing. And, and how do we measure that and propagate that? And so I feel um, Minneapolis is in such, just from the two days I have seen, and I'm so moved and feel privileged to be here um, to share this. And I feel that if you just set it up, like, uh, uh, like uh, it, it's all about how do you set it up. So simple, like Jojo. I didn't tell him what to do, you know, give orders and so forth. I said, please help me. Just in that, it's equalizing the, the ground. So it is, has to do with our sensitivity and our respect for others. And not so much about I, but more about us mm -hmm. together. And you find that you, 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 I find that I'm much happier, right? And a lot of things, other people, you know, together we can do it. And then also, um, you don't have to know everything to start doing something like this one, you know, nothing. But it's good if you don't know so much, it gives room to expert to come and advise you. Then you get the best expert, <laughs> right? So then you get your partners, then happy together. Well, what beats that, right? Uh, we have, I'm gonna ask one question before we wrap up. And there are two people who have the same question essentially, which is, how do you keep from being overwhelmed 
by the projects that you work on, by the grief of the people you're working on, or by the what poverty or, or that you see? What a good question. What a good question. And um, the poorest place and the most broken places, you know, how do one go in? Uh, and I remember we went in. They didn't cry. We cried a lot. And so um, one person said that uh, in his diary said, yeah, those people, they cry easily, they cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they cry so easily, you know? So we feel the grief for them. But I said, if you want to, um, to change the tone, you cannot stay in darkness or in sadness. And so you don't go to the broken, you don't go to the grief, you go to the joy. Mm. You, there has to be a way out of the darkness and the grief and the hopelessness, right? And then in the poverty, and you don't stay there, you figure out what you can do, intervention. I mean, barefoot artist never has much money, but with the little money used wisely, it's like water. You know, and when you have a lot of wealth coming, it washed away everything. It over that overwhelms. But you need to, you know, to, to nurture it so the ground gets soft and and to use it wisely and to discover a lot of hidden treasure in the community. And so, like when I go, um, it, the other reality is that my experience in the broken community is that not so much that I went and helped them. I think I got, like Father Alex, got baptized by the poor and learned how to pray and learned how to uh, live in face of death. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think th those are powerful experiences that will cut deep um, and get us deep in connection with humanity. We suffered a lot of loneliness. Now we don't go to public swimming pool. Everybody has a private swimming pool. You know, that's all good and so forth, but you are alone. And, uh, but when you have that experience, you are in, in touch with humanity. You are not plagued by loneliness because you are connected. And so that's what broken. And the, uh, in darkness is a perfect opportunity for you to do something creative, something fun. You bring light to that darkness. And so, um, so about grief, you go to the joy. Mm -hmm. You play with children. You do, you know, whatever. And then you jump with them. They laugh mm -hmm. and then start to generate uh, joy. But that's not enough. It's not one thing. It's like any project you take is like a tree of life. You, you plant it, then you have to bring sunshine. Sunshine is attention, attention. You have to bring moisture, water, that's resources. But you cannot drown the tree. Mm -hmm. Then you have ongoing um, attention. What is that? That's program. That is setting up. And so that pe the, the art brings something dazzling. It makes all our effort visible. And, but you need to sustain that sense of hopeless so it doesn't peter out. It takes a lot to create that kind of energy. How do you preserve it? You set up program, educational program, learning program, and whatever. And then, they, then you come and do a public art project. You bring it to another level of confidence and sharingness and the trust in the community. Those are software building and essential in building community and building trust in people. Who are your heroes? Who do you look up to? The Who are your heroes? Who do you look up to? Oh. people, you know, so many people, so many stories, but not all on pedestal, mm. not all, you know, like a big man, you know, like a, um, he, he, uh, and Father Alex always, 
yeah, and and many other people, unsung heroes, and people, um, um, volunteers, and go to the trash community. You know, Italian volunteers, many, many, yeah. But the other heroes that we all know, yeah. And I think it remind me of Martin Luther King. I mean, he was a real hero. When he had everything he wanted, civil rights, and uh, um, President Johnson, and then he did something that really kind of so damaging himself about the, the speech against Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. That took courage. He, courage. he was completely hanging out by himself. And for that, he, I think, you know, very soon he got, the, got killed. But he said that um, in time like this, silence is betrayal. Mm. And he had to speak up. And so um, that gives one courage to, um, to take action. Thank you so much. I think Tom's coming up to speak. But I want to say thank you for uh, being here tonight. Can I do a little self-promotion? Yes. <laughs> not for me, but for Barefoot Artists. I, I only have a few copies there, just in case. One is uh, Awakening Creativity it, about the um, Dandelion Project. I only have five books about totally heart-rendering uh, stories of Rwanda survivors. And then a, a DVD, which is the uh, contain this. Um, so if you are interested, I will be doing signing there. Yeah. So sorry, I'm promoting myself. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, Lily, thank you so much for coming and, and being part of our series and sharing your stories with all of us. Um, I think we, this community, you know, for all the joys we have. Thank you so much. Really So thank you all for coming. Um, I think we have a lot to take away. We too are a community where there's, there's plenty of trauma that we've come from and where we're heading, and I think we have a lot of healing that we can take from that, so thank you. Um, uh, please stick around, visit. As, as Lily said, the, books, the, the proceeds will go to Barefoot Artists, which is fantastic. Um, as you move on, please know we have a couple other Next Generation Park lecture series. Uh, I think they're in the handout, but on April 19th about River First, our work on the Mississippi River, and then May 10th, uh, Sabina Ali, who is uh, from, coming from Toronto, talking about how immigrants can find their place in new lands through parks and public space. But thank you for giving us your time this evening. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you all again. And, and Lily and Stephanie, thank you so much. Till, till next time. Thank you.